Fable! He's got it! Oh! And he's safe! That's the best fastball he's thrown all night. Fastball in there for call strike three. He got the inside. Fastball in strike one. The low of a different drive. We had to wait for a sign from the umpire that he could find out ball. Safe, but it's a close play. He's safe to the umpire. These signs are eternal, understood by nearly everyone, regardless of their background or knowledge of baseball. They are indelible, so much so, we just assume they've always been there. But how did these signs of baseball originate? Like the origins of the game itself, the answer is not entirely clear. For a growing majority of upcoming young professional umpires, training started in specialized schools. Student umpires are taught the basic stances and body motions that professional umpires use to call balls or strikes, to signify safe or out, and they practice how to make their rulings with vivid, decisive gestures that are emphatic, firm, and final. I actually attended a Pittsburgh Pirates game. I'm from near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I saw the umpires, and I was about eight or nine years old, and uh, I didn't know who these guys were on the field, and I asked my dad, and we actually wrote them a note, and he told us that schools were in Florida, and I thought that was the farthest place in the world because I was just a little kid. You know, right then I was like, wow, I want to know more about them, and I just moved on up, and now I want to make a profession out of umpire and baseball. you turn around and the ball just touches the foul line and then he makes a shoe string catch. Let's see your call. Call it. An umpire's biggest enemy is surprise. And so it's my job to take these amateur umpires and prepare them for the surprises that they're going to get when they go on the professional diamond. You want to be in fair territory. Why in the world you want to go foul there? Go over there. Am I touching the base or not? You, you know for sure. You're in fair territory, now you can see it. You put yourself out of position. There's no reason to go foul on that. And it's a pretty big challenge because most of them have never even thought a lot of the things that can happen to them. So we take them out on the field every morning after our lecture and we demonstrate with our professional instructors exactly what we were talking about. Demonstrate the rule interpretation, demonstrate the mechanics. Strike three, time! Get my hand, get my hand as hard as you can. Hit this? Yeah, strike again. Hit as hard as you can. Do it again. Harder. Harder. All right, really snap that strike off. Okay? The voice is good, but the sharper this looks, the more believable it's going to be when you call it. A lot of the umpires in the old days umpired on instincts. Uh, they could basically do anything they wanted. There were no, uh, no required mechanics or more required signals. There was, you know, safe and out, and that was about it. As far as the signals for the interference, time, that's interference, you, second base, batter, you're out, you know, that sort of stuff. That has all evolved in the last few years, and uh, it's going to evolve even more, you know. As the rules change, the need for new signals and the new mechanics change. As early as 1860, baseball was by far the young nation's most popular sport, and it was already being described as America's national pastime. If a modern fan was transported back to the early days of baseball, they would recognize the game instantly. But they would also be confused by the lack of communication and archaic rules. The traditional signals that we're so familiar with, the strike call, the safe call, none of those existed. They had not evolved yet. And so the umpire, whenever he was to make a decision, would simply just call it out. That's, that's all he did, no hand signals. 
the umpire was not obligated to call balls and strikes. Here are pitches coming in and there's no call. Is it a ball or is it a strike? They did not have to call every pitch. If the pitcher was not able to put the ball to where the batter or the striker could hit it, then the umpire would yell out a warning. Warning to the pitcher, ball to the bat, sir. Put yourself for a moment, think about if I'm sitting in the stands, how, how did I keep up with what was happening? Unless there was a particularly loud umpire calling the action that day, you might be up in the stands completely unaware of just exactly what's happening down there on the field. Prior to the advent of umpire signals, an invisible wall existed between the fans in the seats and the players on the diamond. No signals for strikes, no signals for safe, no signals for out or foul. There were no electronic scoreboards, there were no announcers to interpret the game. The only signal was the umpire's voice, drowned out by the screams of thousands of excited fans. There's an umpire one time was calling a play at third base. The guy slid in and he gives his signal, safe! The runner jumps up and he says, what do you mean? You call me safe and you got your out signal up. What are you talking about? What am I, safe or out? He says, well, you know, you heard me. Third baseman heard me. But 50,000 people call, saw me call you out. You're out. <laughs> it wasn't until they started using hand signals that the umpire became the fans' direct line of communication. By 1909, arm signals were being used throughout baseball breaking down that imaginary barrier that had separated the fan from the action on the field. But who was responsible for the innovation of umpire signals? Although several have laid claim, only two deserve consideration. Two men who were completely unlike the other. One was self-righteous and autocratic. The other, modest and reserved. They were Big League Baseball's most revered umpire and its most celebrated deaf player. The most remarkable player ever to appear in the Major Leagues was Mr. William Hoy, who played for 14 seasons in the Major Leagues despite the fact that he was deaf and a mute. And now he is, by all odds, the most remarkable player ever to have played because at 99, he is the oldest living former Major League ball player of all time. Judge As Roy, the years I went on, I think that Grandpa began to feel almost forgotten because the time when he played around the late 1800s uh, were so long past and he was living to be so very long, getting up into his 90s now. He was born during the Civil War, remember. He began to feel that he had been forgotten. And when he was asked to throw the ball out at the 1961 World Series, it, it brought back the life in his face. And, and he was thrilled to death for that opportunity. Well, we certainly hope that you make it many more years. Mr. Hoy, thank you very much. 99 New Year's young, William Hoy. In 1886, a most unlikely ball player from Houghtown, Ohio, appeared at the tryouts for the professional Oshkosh Baseball Club. At five foot four and 145 pounds, William Ellsworth Hoy was considered small to be a professional ball player. But although he was short, his stature was not Hoy's greatest obstacle. Since the age of two, Hoy was profoundly deaf and had difficulty speaking. But in spite of his deafness, Hoy made the team and quickly gained the respect of his teammates. He was promptly named Dummy, a nickname he would insist on using until his dying day, just months short of his 100th birthday. In those days, they called people who were deaf, deaf and dumb. So the nickname Dummy came about, and he never found it insulting to be called Dummy, even though he was so very highly intelligent. 
uh, he, he considered it a very uh, nice term of endearment, really, and preferred that to being called Will or Willie, which some people did refer to him as. As a young man, Hoy graduated valedictorian of his class at the Ohio School for the Deaf, where he became highly proficient in the unique communication of the deaf, American Sign Language, the very language that may have inspired the signals of baseball. But life was tough for him in 19th century, very difficult, but no interpreters, not like we have today in our modern deaf world, we have interpreters all over the place. But things were not easy for Dummy Hoy. He missed 75% of everything. He still found ways to overcome that communication problem always. Back in the 19th century, I can envision Hoy on the playing field. No one else knew sign language, but that was not important. What was important were the rules of the game. Of course, he knew the rules of the game. But there were times when gestures were needed. They didn't pre-plan the gestures. All it took was a situation, a communication issue inviting the cooperation of everyone to find a solution. Falcons on three. Falcons on three. One, two, three. Falcons! Even as the memory of Dummy Hoy fades into obscurity, his strength of will and determination reaches across generations to another unassuming hero. Like Hoy, Doug Giacconi forged a path to overcome adversity and silently change those around him with actions that speak louder than words. I felt kind of alone. Sometimes when people were talking, I wanted to know what they were talking about but I couldn't. So it was hard for me to be together with the team. I always felt alone, lonely. Doug, being a deaf member of the team, it was going to be a difficult experience for him. And as he grew older as a teenager, he felt more and more isolated. Being the coach, I knew there was something we had to do to make him feel a part of the team like anybody else would. The idea for Sign Language Club was inspired by a speech Doug made in my team leadership class where he talked about being isolated and not having as many friends. I thought it was the easiest choice in the world to bring my entire team to learn sign language so that we could at least break the ice and get to know Doug. <laughs> Gonna win. We got this. By going to sign language club and learning some really simple signs, things changed in a hurry. Doug became more comfortable. He was able to communicate with some of the guys on the team, just like anybody else would. We knew like baseball terminology. We could like talk to Doug about like, the game, the situation, about the umpires, everything, the other team. Even just normal stuff that you're shooting around, talking to him, you can actually converse with him, interact. We're going to take square drill, ground balls, fly balls, and then uh, we're going to work on base running. I felt great. A lot more motivated. I felt really excited, ready to communicate with the team, like I belonged to the team. I think the team became closer and communicated better and had fun together with me. The acquisition of signs has increased so much now. They're sharper, they're better. The point of Sign Language Club is to learn to understand Doug and to be able to communicate with Doug, but it, on the side, it's made us a better team. Just as Doug Jacomi's team learned sign language to communicate on and off the field, 
Dummy Hoy taught his team how to sign over a century ago. Hoy's team developed a system of communication that gave them a distinct advantage on the field and created a unique bond of friendship. Many of the American Sign Language signs that Hoy would have used are now obsolete. The archaic palms down sweeping sign for no, used by Hoy in the 19th century, has an intriguing connection to modern umpire signs. Today, when umps use the signal safe, could it have come from a situation where Dummy Hoy was unsure of a call at home plate? Was the runner out? How would the ump say no? I can see Hoy gesturing to the umpire, out, no, and with a simple response from the ump of out or out, no, Hoy would understand. Out still means out, but the sign for no took on a new meaning, safe. A single sign that stands alone. Throughout his career, many of Hoy's teammates, including Connie Mack and Clark Griffith, learned to communicate through sign language and created lasting friendships. There is no question that the teaching of sign language made life much easier for Hoy, but it could also have had unintentional consequences. The inspiration for the signs of baseball. The old arbitrator, Bill Clem, shows National League efficiency behind the bat. Listen to him bark out balls and strikes. You know, as a young umpire coming up, you hear the name Bill Clem, and to me, he was sort of a hero that I never had a chance to see umpire or meet, but the legends, of course, uh, are phenomenal. And he umpired the last 16 years behind the plate. And, of course, the plate is where the most pressure is. You certainly wouldn't find anybody today in professional baseball that would want that challenge. It's pretty hard to keep everybody happy on every pitch. Bill Clem was one of the greatest umpires baseball has known. When he came out to protest, he'd take his shoe and draw a line. Don't cross that line. And everyone, all of us knew if you cross a line, you were ejected. And I'm sure it prevented a lot of ejections when he drew that line. on a bet. You have got to be kidding me. Clem, you couldn't call a strike if it hit you the big fat puss. He's right. If you had one more good eye, you'd be a cyclops. Don't you cross the Rio Grande, son. I'm going to turn around and walk away. You cross that line, and I will send you to the shower. You understand me? Depending on the situation, when you went out to protest, that line wouldn't mean a thing if you really wanted to get him. But if it was a questionable call, you know, and uh, you weren't sure, that line would stop you. You would stop right there by that line to 180 and go back to the dugout. That ain't right, Clem. That ain't right. You've been calling that way all game long. You've been calling like that. Yeah! That's what this is about. You've been trying to run me. You've been trying to run me. Get in the dugout. Come on, you get in there. All game long. Come on, give me a break. Mr. Mitchell, are you also in need of a shower? Clem, you stink! Maybe they should throw you out with the dirty shower water! 
Obviously, sir, water, you have not had the pleasure of meeting. Better up. Many will say the best umpire was Bill Clem, who called him as he saw him for 46 years. Bill was once asked if he ever missed a call. Did you, Bill? No. Never missed one from here. I maybe could have missed one, but never from here. I challenged the world to prove to me that ever I called a foul ball fair or a fair ball foul, or that I ever missed giving the correct decision on whether a ball was or was not caught. In 1874, William Joseph Clem was born in Rochester, New York. He grew up when baseball's surging popularity filled enormous new ballparks across the country. It was also a time when umpires were regarded as villains by fans and players alike. Watching baseball in the 1880s, Clem surely witnessed the physical and verbal abuse that made the umpire's life intolerable. Little did Clem know that he would become a great catalyst for change in the years that followed. As an umpire, Clem would become known for ejecting players for the slightest bit of disrespect, especially calling him by his despised nickname, Catfish. I met Bill Clem the first time in Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, and I was playing third base for Cincinnati, and I was the leadoff man. I'd heard that he was an aggressive umpire, and I'd heard that he was a ferocious tiger of an umpire, so there was a certain amount of awe attached to my first appearance at bat. I had always heard him referred to as catfish, so I thought that I'd ingratiate myself with him a little bit. So I said to him, good afternoon, catfish, and he yanked off his mask, and the tobacco juice flew everywhere, and he got his ugly puss right up against mine, and he said, young man, he says, you're new in this league, don't you dare ever call me catfish again. I can assure you I never did. <laughs> <laughs> he was something else. Umpiring is now an elite profession. Out of thousands of recruits, only a select few will make it to the big leagues. He's out! You're gonna get hit in baseball. You're gonna get hit with a ball. If you have the fear of being hit, you shouldn't be umpiring. This is real with you. Oh, uh, well, I'll tell you straight up. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of work to do, but I would just love to officiate my whole life. Really would like to take that somewhere, definitely. That ball leaves my hand. Where were the runners when it left my hand? It's not where were they when the ball rolled out of play. Where were they when it left that right fielder's hand when he was back on the warning track? Do you think it might be important to watch the ball and glance at runners? We can test a person pretty well and find out after five weeks whether they have what it takes to be a professional. There are a lot of guys who will be very good umpires without the pressure of major league or minor league managers. And so we've got to identify those people the people who have the confidence to go out on the field sell themselves in real high-pressure situations. Oh, my goodness! He was past the base when you called him out! Every time we see you, you're screwing plays up right and left. Why don't you get in position where you can see the play? Do you know what position is? Well, tell me how to you got to get over here where you can see the play. A lot of what I teach comes from personal experience. I dealt in my era with some of the biggest names in managing, like Earl Weaver. He was a real challenge. Earl and I used to go round and round like Earl did with every umpire that I know of. It, it looked like you were about to lose a player, and a player was about to get thrown out. You had to get out there and do his arguing and get him away. You know, you're 
coaches will grab him and you've got to get in there and make sure that he stays in the ball game. You want to let the umpire know that you are really hurting me, you're hurting my team, you're hurting my chances to keep my job. I always looked at it like it was a challenge, an opportunity to prove how good you were rather than let somebody intimidate you. Look at it as an opportunity to show, hey, I'm well trained, I'm young, but I can handle myself out there. During Bill Clem's career, the umpire evolved from a target of ridicule to a respected professional. Known as the father of modern umpires, Clem's authoritative style is widely regarded as the catalyst of that change. You knew what he was going to call a pitch before he called it. And a good umpire, and I'm going to say this now, is, a, is an umpire that the hitter, the pitcher, and the catcher knows what the umpire is going to call the pitch before he calls it. Well, he's a good showman, but he had a lot of ego. Uh, he was a small man, you know, he probably thought he was Napoleon, but he wanted the attention. He loved the adulation of the public, and uh, he got it all right. Bill Clem's impressive career earned him the honor of being among the first umpires enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. It is here, in baseball's most revered temple, that Clem's link to the signs of baseball would become gospel. His plaque at Cooperstown credits him for the introduction of signals indicating strikes and fair or foul balls. There's no doubt Clem's early use of flamboyant signals delighted fans and inspired his peers. And as his popularity grew, so did his larger-than-life persona. I invented the standard safe and out signals used today by umpires in sandlots and in World Series games. The jerk of the thumb over the shoulder for out and the palms-down gesture for safe. These were innovations of convenience to me, but they were a boon to fans out of range of the umpire's voice. So, when next you go out to the ballpark, you will see many things that are commonplace today. Many of these innovations are mine, and all of them help baseball grow from a county fair attraction to the great beloved spectacle it is today. Although the legend of Clem is literally cast in bronze at the Hall of Fame, many historians believe he had nothing to do with the innovation of hand signals. Somebody who had as long an umpiring career as Bill Clem probably got asked questions a lot of times, and I think you tend to shade your answer to giving people the answer that they want to hear. So I think Clem probably started to shade his story, and before long, he probably, you know, he probably started to remember it uh, a little differently than how it actually happened. Bill Clem on his plaque said he invented hand signals. Of course, he didn't invent hand signals any more than I did. We live with myths every day. Uh, you can call them myths, they're lies, or uh, untruths, or misquotes, whatever you want to. But that's just part of all, all part of life. I'm playing for the Philadelphia Phillies, and we're playing in Shy Park in Philadelphia against Pittsburgh. Well, Danny McFadden is pitching for Pittsburgh, and Al Lopez is catching. And Danny McFadden has a great sidearm curveball, and it uh, two strikes on me. And he throws that curveball, and I back up, you know, away from it, and it breaks right over the plate. But for some reason, Clem called it a ball. And when he did, Al Lopez turned around and brushed right up against his breast protector and he's ejected. McFadden comes in from the mound, he touches the breast protector, he's ejected. Both of them ejected. And I'm standing over there on the side watching him and Clem edges over to where I'm standing and he says quietly, how could you take such a beautiful pitch he knew he missed it, and his motto, of course, I never missed one. He did that day. He missed that one. Arm Brister hit a sacrifice fly. Tenth inning in the final game at Pittsburgh in the National League playoffs. There. 
Tied the winning run. Throw to second. High. By Carl Smith over to third. Safe. We are going to have that a second. We're going to have an argument. They may reverse this decision. The Red Sox are arguing interference at the plate. They are saying that a batter, after butting, interfered with Carl Smith, the catcher, in fair territory. Apparently, home plate umpire Larry Barnett is not going to reverse this decision. 1975 World Series in Cincinnati, I had the controversial play with Ed Armbrister, the batter for Cincinnati, Carlton Fisk, the catcher for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, pitch was up and in on Armbrister with a runner on first base. He leaned back to bunt the ball down the first base line. He broke for first base. Fisk broke to get the ball. As an umpire, I pointed fair with my hand to indicate that the ball was a fair ball. They collided, they had a bump. Fisk picked the ball up, threw the ball into center field. Then Carlton wanted interference. On a play like that, I'm man. telling you, the man interfered with that man on play. I want to ask you if he touched him before he got his hands on that ball. Now hand signals are taught that we didn't have when I went through umpiring school, where you would signal, you know, no interference, no interference indicating with a safe call, like you would call a guy safe on the bases or, or at home plate now. And as I reflect back and watch that play on tape, had I used that signal, no interference, no interference, it probably would have made my life a lot easier with the fans in Boston and maybe on that particular play. I can't help that it happened right there. I'll tell you one thing, it's a loud operation and you and I know it right now. Larry Barnett's conflict illustrates how the lack of communication can challenge the umpire's authority. It may have been Bill Clem that first realized that specific hand signals could provide better control of the game. As the game evolves, communication needs continue to arise, and new ways to interpret the action are created. Modern strikes as we know them today were not routinely called until 1887. With the new rules that dictated a called ball or strike on each pitch, Dummy Hoy was now at a severe disadvantage. He was forced to look back at the umpire for each subsequent call. The constant distraction not only broke Hoy's concentration, but also left him vulnerable to quick pitching. I cannot imagine being Dummy Hoy. First of all, not being able to hear, and the umpires haven't invented hand signals yet, that's got to take away greatly from his concentration to be able to hit. Now here's a pitch coming at 95 miles an hour. He has to concentrate on pitch. Now he thinks it's ball strike. No, he looks back here. Ball, strike, strike, ball. He has to get that confirmation from the umpire, then turn around, adjust his thinking again, try to hit, try to concentrate, had to affect his average had to have. I know it affected mine greatly. Just because it takes away that concentration that you need to focus on the pitcher, now you're focusing on the umpire. As a deaf player, I was at a distinct disadvantage. To constantly swivel my head to see the resulting call of the umpire broke my rhythm while at bat. Everyone knew it. I was afraid of losing my position on the team. Therefore, I came up with an idea to develop a system of hand signals whereby my coach would immediately indicate whether the pitch was a strike or a ball. As a left-handed batter, I was in direct view of third base. Mr. Salee would stand just abreast of third base and would indicate with his left hand if the pitch was a ball, pitch is a strike, and with his right hand if the pitch was a strike. This way, I would never have to look away or step out of the box. This foiled the efforts of pitchers to quick pitch me, and the resulting improvement in my hitting was quite astounding. The new rule of routinely called balls and strikes was, at first, a problem for Hoy. But his innovative system of signals would make a remarkable improvement in his batting average in just one season. Many people believe this was the point at which an innovation entered baseball's culture that would forever change the way fans would enjoy the game. 
development that would ultimately inspire the covert hand language from catcher to pitcher and the secret batting instruction from manager to slug. An innovation that would become the core of each umpire's unique identity and one of the most colorful parts of America's game, the science of baseball. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be present at the dedication of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. I should like to dedicate this museum to all America, to lovers of good sportsmanship, healthy bodies, keen minds, for those are the principles of baseball. So it is to them that I propose to dedicate this shrine of sportsmanship. There's a man, uh, Dummy Hall, should be in the Hall of Fame. I've always said that. Great ball player, great outfielder. He was the originator of that umpire giving the sign, a ball or strike. Okay. Well, that's what started that. They didn't used to do that. He was the one who started that. That's a fact. And that man I didn't even mention for the Hall of Fame. It's just a mistake there. I kind of grew up in, as a baseball fan, having read and heard that Dummy Hoy invented hand signals in the major leagues, and I believed it to be true, had no reason to believe otherwise. And someone once asked me to document this, elaborating on his invention. The further I investigated, the less proof I found that Dummy Hoy had anything to do with hand signals. Even as early as 1909, there was an article about this new phenomenon, but no one person was given any credit, no names were given. It was just kind of a phenomenon that had developed. The consensus was that they were adopted about 1906, which was about four years after Dummy Hoy left baseball. So why would something be invented after he was gone if they were inspired by him or done for his benefit? It turns out that the credit really came from Sam Crawford, where he made just a passing statement that Dummy Hoy was the reason that umpires use hand signals. That became a, an established fact to baseball fans from the 60s onward. That's just taken on a life of its own. I don't think Sam was lying. I think maybe he was just combining memories in his mind 60 years later, and, and it came out a little differently than they actually happened. Due to the lack of historical evidence backing up Sam Crawford's claim, many historians remain skeptical about the extent of Hoy's contribution. There are other historical accounts that add further uncertainty. Umpire Cy Wrigler used signs during his early career in the minors, only to find that they were already in use when he started in the majors. In 1884, a deaf pitcher named Ed Dundon reportedly umpired a game using rudimentary hand gestures. Were umpire signs born from the inspiration of one individual? Or did they evolve from the contributions of many to fill a necessity of communication? The parks were so large at this time, they were seating about 5,000 people, and a lot of them found that they could not hear what the umpire was saying in his decisions. They started writing into the newspapers in the 1870s, and they wanted the umpire to add hand signals to his decisions. But the umpires dragged their feet a bit. They were reluctant. They didn't want to look silly. And it was not until 1909 that all of them agreed to do it. I think we must credit the fans and their supporters, the reporters, who influenced the uh, umpires to make that change in baseball, which has made it so much more colorful for fans. Regardless of the source, historians agree that the need for communication between fan and field became the tipping point for the consistent use of umpire signs. But what was the source of the idea to use hand signals to fill this need? Although there is limited historical record documenting the influence of sign language, many continue to seek the proof that will link Hoy to his legacy. I'm not comfortable with the idea of, quote, hearing people 
taking credit for those signs. Clem has no exposure to deaf community. I mean, how could he come up overnight with a sign like that? He just came up with that? Clem invented signs, supposedly in the 1900s. But prior to that, I have found many newspaper columns showing that reporters had made reports of hand signals being used on third base for Hoy to be able to see. The signs were there already, prior to Clem, before 1906. Even in 1906, the Washington Post mentioned, Umpire Silk O'Loughlin sprained his larynx Tuesday, ordering manager Stahl off the field at Washington and had no voice today. Instead of calling the decisions, he employed Dummy Hoy's mute signal code, which certainly was a novelty for Silk. Siebel scored the last run in the sixth. Years after Hoy had left professional baseball, his unique signaling code was still being referenced by reporters. Even near the end of his career, Hoy's opinion about the benefit of signs was considered newsworthy. A number of baseball players and managers are talking of introducing this year a system of signals to be used in the future by the baseball umpire for the purpose of conveying his decisions to the spectators at games. Billy Hoy, who is at Cincinnati, in speaking of this scheme a day or two ago, said, I think the idea is a splendid one. I have often been told by frequenters of the game that they take considerable delight in watching the coacher signal balls and strikes to me. As by these signals, they can know to a certainty what the umpire with a not too overstrong voice is saying. I can't see any reason why the rule should not be. It's difficult to explain to a hearing person what it would be like to be deaf. You have to be deaf to understand it. How life is without sound. It's visual and Hoy had the same experiences. But I think he made himself unique by putting more effort into communication with his teammates. Unlike the outspoken personality of Bill Clem, some feel Dummy Hoy's humble nature is why there is limited historical record proving a direct connection to umpire signals. We never questioned anything other than the fact that he had started hand signals. We knew that he had, and it was an accepted fact in our family. We were taught not to say, my grandfather was a great ball player and he invented hand signals in baseball. We would never say a thing such as that, uh, because that would be nothing that he would even like us to do. He felt that his accomplishments uh, would stand on their own. May this plaque, and more importantly, the story that goes with it, be an inspiration for generations to come for all those so fortunate as to attend this fine institution. How in the world did his life change so dramatically from a cobbler in a village of less than 100 people to a dashing and wildly popular baseball star. When asked at the age of 82, he replied, the achievement I am most proud of took place in Oshkosh in the opening series with St. Paul. Apples, get your apples, only two cents. Oh, thanks, sir, enjoy the game. Of the many achievements I have had in life, the one of which I am the proudest took place early in my career. My confidence was high, and I distinctly remember feeling the exhilaration of the start of the new season. But the subsequent events of the game would turn my exhilaration into feelings of regret and dread. Come one, come all, folks! Witness our beloved hometown boys as they face the powerful batsman of St. Paul. 
Will they be heroes or will they be goats? That a boy, that a boy, throw that in there. Throw that drop right in there. You got it, kid. He's all yours. Watch that line over there. That's a fair catch. Batsman is out. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mr. Doolittle, Mr. Doolittle, I must protest, sir. That ball was clearly caught on a short hop. The hitter is safe. That was not a fair catch. Mr. Thomas, the runner blocked my view, but I'm sure it was a fair catch. With all due respect, sir, my whole team, hell, the whole town saw that it was not a fair catch. Well, perhaps Mr. Hoy can shed some light on the situation. Oh, yeah. Asking the hometown player. I wonder what he'll say. Sir, sir. I assure you that catch was clean. Uh, I saw it with my sir, own two eyes. that's wide. not accurate. I will stick my reputation on it. Let's go. There is no catch. The gentleman is safe at first. What the hell? What the hell, Devin? We had the catch. We had a second out. After admitting the true nature of the play, all I could see was the team owner, Mr. Chase, standing by our bench. I suspected my time may have been up. His intelligence impressed me as much as his integrity. He was a very unassuming and shy person and was proud as could be of his accomplishments, but would never uh, brag or promote himself. When the game concluded, the fans and my teammates alike were still quite upset at my honesty, which had given St. Paul the advantage. I felt obliged to approach my manager, Frank Salee, to offer my apologies. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not me you need to apologize to. It's Mr. Chase you need to talk to. Thanks for coming in. Come on. Come on, come on. As I approached Mr. Chase, I fully expected the worst. I knew this may be a defining moment in my career. And then something most unexpected happened. His response contained neither curses nor condemnation. It simply read, I would rather lose fairly than win by cheating. Thank you. After playing for Oshkosh, Hoy would go on to a major league career lasting 14 seasons on six different clubs becoming one of the fastest and most feared base runners of his era. Traveling from team to team, he would take his unique system of signals with him, continuing to teach sign language throughout baseball. If Hoy's signaling code was the inspiration behind umpires starting to use signs, does this alone make him worthy of baseball's greatest honor? The Hall of Fame, of course, is the ultimate goal of almost all ball players. You know, there are some people in the members of the Hall of Fame maybe shouldn't be there. I'm not going to call their call the shot. There's some, of course, we all know that should be in and are not in, in my opinion. The Hall of Fame is a great place to be, and it's like politics. If you get the numbers, you get in. If you don't, you go home. Well, the guys who really get shortchanged in, in our system of being voted on to, by the veterans to get into the Hall of Fame are the guys who played way back when Dummy, Dummy, Hoy, Dummy Hoy played. How many guys are alive that saw Dummy Hoy play? It amazes me the things that he did accomplish as a player. Also, what it comes down to, when you really stop and think about it, it's hitting and running and catching and throwing, and he had all this wonderful natural ability, and he just was able to overcome the, the fact that he could not hear and become a, a, a wonderful player.
Now, there's a lot of people who have campaigned for, for Dummy Hoy. I've got many, many letters from uh, people who will say, hey, Dummy Hoy should be a part of uh, the Hall of Fame. I mean, he deserves it. As Frankie Robertson was to the black America, so was Dummy Hoy to deaf America. Frankie broke the color barrier. Dummy Hoy broke the communication barrier and many other things. Hoy's success in many ways showed what deaf can do. And it went on, he opened the door for many other deaf leaders to succeed in different fields. Over the years, Hoy's accomplishments have been recognized, including induction into the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame in 2003. However, efforts to have him added to the roster in Cooperstown have yet to be successful. Hopes of all deaf America, and many hearing people too, want to see Tommy Hoy succeed in getting into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. It would be a dream come true. I hope I can live long enough to see it happen. It's a flying seat with spikes splashing in the sun against the bullets of the ball. With the ball. The mystery behind the origin of hand signals continues to be steeped in myth and may never be solved. If Hoy's system of signals were the inspiration, perhaps it took Clem's flamboyant use to make them stick. On the surface, Clem and Hoy may appear to have little in common, but both men changed the course of the game, greatly improving it for those who follow. The game continues to evolve with nearly imperceptible changes. Each baseball generation inspires the next. From coach to player, player to fan, father to son. As memories fade, the roots of baseball's unique language may be lost to history, but the spirit of innovation and understanding that inspire their creation will live on. Everyone in the classroom has a shot at, at going as far as they want to go. And not just on the field, but off the field, how to, how to be very confident about yourself and, and follow through with everything you want to do in your life. I want to be the best umpire in the world. I mean, that's everyone's goal here. And even if I don't make it to the major leagues or anything like that, you know, I still want to be involved in baseball. It's the best thing that's ever happened in my life. Before, I didn't know anything about Dummy Hoy. I didn't know that he was a real deaf player that could play baseball really well. That really inspired me because I started to think that I could play baseball really well just like him. Just like any hearing professional player. Being able to communicate with him makes me feel like I've accomplished something as a teacher and as a coach. It just takes a heart to serve somebody else and to think more about what somebody else might need. And I really know my kids are getting that from this experience. It's not about a game where you chase a ball around the field. It's about learning and helping each other. The signs of the time broke down the final barrier that separated the spectator from the field. For the first time, fans could immediately understand the action from the last seat of the highest row of the largest park. Bowman down to third, Wade Box! Can he do it again? first invention of its kind, the turning point of fan experience, the game's greatest innovation, the signals of baseball.